friends. This podcast ended up being a little bit longer than mom and I expected. So I've cut it into two still significantly long halves. Um, so this is half number one that you're about to listen to or to watch on YouTube. And on YouTube, we do have images of all the art that we're talking about if you're interested in seeing that. But I hope you enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the Adventures in Arting podcast, where we analyze, explore, and celebrate the creative journey. My name is Julie Faye Van Balzer, and I am a working artist living outside of Boston. I've been hosting this podcast with my super special co-host and my mom, Eileen Shoe Balzer, since 2012. Hi, Mom. Hi. So uh, a couple things of note before we get started. The first is I really hope you'll check out monthly membership at BallsDesigns.com. Membership offers a diverse array of classes, tutorials, vlogs, and art inspiration for artists at all levels. Um, some exciting updates are coming to membership, and so you're going to want to be a member and uh, find out all about that. So today, this is episode 145, and I have tentatively named it what's the point of abstract art? Uh, and it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of not. And I would say it's, it's, um, so at the, I'll just talk from a personal point of view. At the beginning of my art journey, I had a lot of questions. And as I think a lot of people do about like, how do you make abstract art? Like, what is the point of it? Is it just to be pretty? Like, I don't, I, there was a lot of sort of like, I don't get it. And then I was reading recently, um, Artsy came out with uh, sales numbers from, from 2023. And of course, figurative art is much more popular for people to buy than abstract art. Um, figurative art would be, uh, it doesn't have to have an actual person in it, but things that have things that are recognizable. So like a landscape, a bird, you know, a horse picture, like whatever it is. It's something that's more representational, shall we say. Okay. Um, and then abstract art is, I think, a big question mark for a lot of people. So today I thought that mom and I could chat a little bit about abstract art from our points of view. This is obviously not like we are the truth tellers and this is the only, you know, way that you may view abstract art. This is just two people's opinions about abstract art. I also, you know, we restructured the podcast at the beginning of 2024. And it's been much more in kind of, I guess I would call it like a teaching mode, sort of, um, I stopped blogging and I really wanted to pour myself into the podcast. And I found that I was creating a lot of podcasts that were kind of like blog posts in the sense that they were very much like steps for you to take things that you can do. But one of the things that I think has been so great about our podcast over the more than 10 years that we've been podcasting is always just the sort of more casual conversations that mom and I have. So, uh, one of the things that mom and I have been talking about and sort of working out is having the podcast be a mixture of a lot of different formats. So today we're in a kind of a looser format, just sort of chit chatting uh, about the topic. So I'm going to um, put the spotlight on you first, mom, and say, define abstract art. Go. Define it. I don't <laughs> know if I can. I guess it's if I don't recognize any forms. Um yeah, like a circle or something. But I mean, it, if I look at it at the whatever it is, which I guess let's talk about painting or prints or something. And if I look at it and I can't immediately say, oh, it's a dog and a piece of cheese, then uh, I'm going to call it abstract. Right. And so I think like it's a really hard definition. It was kind of a mean trick question that I threw at mom. Yes, but why should that stop you? From why should that stop? You know why? Because you're the smartest person I know. And if you can't answer it, nobody can. Um, because abstract art, there's so many question marks. Like, so mom gave a great definition. So now we say like uh, a cubist work where there's, you know, you know uh, maybe part of a violin showing. I'm thinking of a Picasso piece. And it's like, okay it's meant to represent a violin from many different angles. So in that sense, it's representational work, but the presentation to me as the viewer is somewhat chaotic and somewhat abstract because I'm not really sure that I actually see what Picasso is trying to create. And there's a whole bunch of that kind of stuff in cubism and futurism where you're like, wait a second, 
is this a representation or is this abstract? And then some people argue that all art, unless you're doing, unless you're doing like photorealistic work is essentially abstract because it's an abstraction. It's a step, it's not a realistic version of whatever it is that you're seeing. So, I mean, I think that's part of when we start to talk about abstract, like what are we really talking about? And I always think- Well, well even you can get to the point where you can say, what you see is not what's really there. It's what mm -hmm. your brain decides is there. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, maybe everything we see is an abstract. But the question I would say to you is, mm -hmm. what does it matter? Ah, and this is absolutely what I was getting to, which is I think for us to have the conversation about like, what's the point of abstract art? We have to at least agree on a definition between the two of us, if nothing else, so that we're talking about the same thing and not doing an apples and oranges conversation. So for the purpose of our conversation, and that's all the only point I wanted to make is just that so that all of us, including you who are listening or watching, you know, so that we're all having the same conversation. I think we're going with mom's definition, which is if you can't see something representational, a house, a tree, you know, whatever else that we're going to say it's abstract art, meaning mostly shapes, Our lines, forms. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I asked mom before the podcast to send me a quick list of some abstract artists that she liked and some abstract artists that she struggled with. Um, and she wrote back, I said, I think I actually, the way I think I put it to you was like artists that you don't like. And you were like, it's not a matter of liking and don't liking. It's a matter of responding to and not responding to. And I think that is so key in a conversation about art. So I wanted to just highlight that uh, conversation because it's not that some art is good and some is bad. Everybody has different taste. That's the wonderful thing about art. We all get to like different things and all of us are right. So it's, it's like, there are some things that I personally respond to that other people don't. And an instance of that is we're going to talk, there's at least one artist that mom sent me on her like list. That's on my like, eh, kind of list. Uh, so I put together a quick PowerPoint for people who are watching on YouTube to be able to see some of the work that we're talking about. I will also try to include that in the, um, show notes. Um, if you're listening, we're going to do our best to describe the art because of course this is a podcast. So here we go. Um, so the first artist that I personally really respond to is Richard Diebenkorn. I'm a huge fan of his Berkeley series. Um, Diebenkorn is an artist who has also done a ton of landscape. He's done portraiture. Uh, his abstract work, I think, from what I've read, sort of began as landscape that veered into an abstraction. So there are two pictures that I'm showing from his Berkeley series, Berkeley number 23 and Berkeley number 32. I think they're both from 1955, but I wasn't 100% sure. Um, and I think the thing that I like about his work is that it can both be read as a landscape and as an abstract piece of art. I also really like he has a super active brush stroke. So you continually see the hand of the artist and though, and although I believe it must be very planned out, it has a spontaneous feeling. There's sort of um, an aliveness in it. So I was recently juried into a show, and one of the things that the juror said when he was writing about why he picked the pieces that he picked is he said he looked for work that was alive. And I feel very much that Stephen Korn's Berkeley series is alive. And I think I personally respond to abstract art that has that alive feeling. Do you like Demon Corn, Mom? Yes, and in fact, both of these I like. And I was thinking that I could like say, oh, this looks like a cliff with a bird up on the, in the sky and a map mm -hmm. of you know things on the bottom. But I think there's also this human need to somehow see a, sh a meaningful shape in things that may not have one, like looking at clouds and saying, oh, that looks like a horse, when in fact, it, it's just our desire to close the dots and somehow define what we see. I think we don't need to do that, though. And looking at this, I respond to, I think you're right about the lively brush stroke and the sense of the artist's hand. Mm -hmm. I like the colors. Um, mm -hmm. 
I like the fact that the when colors I... are kind of what I call quote unquote sophisticated colors, which is to say they're like slightly toned. They're even though some of them are bright, they're not harsh. They're really lovely. And I also feel like um, I could look at them for a long time up close, far away and get different things out of it. I wouldn't get bored having this is what I'm saying. Having this on my wall, if you'd like to give it to me for my birthday, <laughs> one of these, I, I wouldn't get bored with it. Me neither. I think these are, are only a couple million dollars, you know, like seven or eight million. So, you know, uh, what, I was, what I was going to say, shopping cart. right? Add to cart. Um, there is some work of Richard Demon Corns that I don't like, that it, not that I don't, but I don't respond to as much. So for instance, he has a series called Ocean Park series that I find less my style, partially because I find it less alive. It's much more controlled. It's much more linear. And I think as we head through talking about some more artists, this is something that I've learned about myself. Now, going through this exercise of talking about why you like certain artists work and why you don't, or even why you like a this certain piece from an artist and not this other piece is incredibly useful to understanding what you want to see in your own work. Like I know that the worst thing anybody can say about my work to me is that it feels static or it feels held, not because those are bad things. Some people really like work that feels like that. It's comforting, it's calming to them. I need for my work to feel alive, to be jumping off, to be full of movement, for me to be happy with it. And that's what I respond to in other people's work as well. One of the reasons yeah. this feels, just go back for one second, yeah. that it felt so active is actually, if you look at it, although you think, okay, the one on the left, Berkeley 32 is like layers, horizontal layers, but they're not exactly, everything isn't perpendicular to the edge of the paper. And the one on the right, again, you might say, oh, it's like straight lines, but in fact, they're slightly off. They're slightly at an angle. And to me, that's where you get the rhythm and the action. Yeah, they're, the lines are imperfect. He's got some diagonals in there. There's a lot of stuff where it's not rigid. It's not rigid, which again, we're going to hit some stuff that is rigid. So Kandinsky was one of your picks for an abstract yeah. artist that you love. I tried to pick two very different pieces of his. So if you're not familiar with Kandinsky's art, he has a huge catalog of artwork. Um, the two pieces that I picked, one is one of his very large finished pieces. It's called Transverse Line from 1923. And one of the things he's so good at doing is taking many disparate objects and kind of putting them together into a composition that's full of movement. And I also admire that so much of his work seems like clean and polished and yet still alive and full of movement. The other piece um, that I picked is a piece that's much looser called Improvisation 31, parentheses, Sea Battle from 1913. This piece has a very like watercolor feel, very scribbled, very hand done. It's one of his earlier pieces where he's doing some exploring, I think, of the ideas that come out later. So, Mom, why did you pick Kandinsky as a fave? Okay. Um, again, I could look at each of these for a long time, see something different each time I look, come back to it tomorrow, and it would still look different. And I, I feel emotion when I look at them. I feel ideas coming to me. Um, the colors speak to me. The differences in the weight of the brush strokes speak to me. The fact that uh, there's somehow, there's a reference to things that might be outside the paper or, or the canvas. That, so it's, has a continuation feeling, you know, it has a wide opening growth kind of feeling, not a small cramped contained feeling. I, I just feel when I look at these two, I can hear that there could be music that goes yeah, along. With yeah. It. One of Kandinsky's most famous series, I think, is uh, at MoMA. They used to have a room dedicated to just hit these pieces. I don't know if they still do. But it was when he was trying to visually represent jazz music. You know? And I think that that is a really interesting idea. Like, what is the visual representation of jazz music? And if it, and jazz, in the end, is 
so many different people doing their own thing and yet together to make something together. And I feel like that's a really apt description of what Kandinsky is able to do is to take really different things kind of that are doing their own thing and yet make them work together towards something where if it's not necessarily harmony, it's still a single composition. Right. I, I often use him in classes to talk about how you can take really different things and bring them together because he does such a good job of it. So yet this yeah. is something you said you didn't, you don't respond. Oh no, it wasn't an next one. Okay. Yes. I would say, you know, on the one hand, you, the left one is much more controlled than the right in terms of the forms, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're sharper, whereas there's a real looseness in the, in the improvisation 31 C battle, but they both work for me as pieces that make me feel that there's a dance going on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're full of movement. They're alive. And I think that's something we both respond to. I yeah. wish that I could find somebody who really liked sort of like quiet held work so that we could hear why they like it so much. Cause I know that that's not sort of, that's not the aesthetic we both respond to. Okay, so next up, I picked someone who's a little bit different. So you know, I was thinking of her. Oh, so this, is, this is Hilma off Clint. Um, and I picked, this is a view of an exhibition that she had at the Guggenheim in 2018. It was called uh, Hilma of Clint Paintings for the Future. And I'm try trying to think how to begin to describe these paintings. So these are giant canvases, like, enormous they're larger than human scale they are vertical uh they're definitely what i would consider work in a series meaning similar colors similar motifs they have a kind of floral undertone which made me think for a moment about whether i should include them in abstract because some of them i think are representative of flowers it's kind of like that georgia o'keefe question are her flower paintings that are close up of the interior flowers abstract or since you know it's the close-up of in the interior of a flower is that a representational work and of course does it matter so these have um bright colors the dominant colors are kind of like a bright orange and a nice lavender there's yellow they definitely are feminine they feel like drawings that have been colored in they have sort of clearly defined parts there's definitely a drawing element in them i think scale is important to my attraction to them i think i would not be as attracted to them if they were small but i think what I respond to um, in her work is there's a strong graphic quality where she manages to do this thing that I love and mom always criticizes me for, by the way, but I'll say, and Hilma of Clint does it and Matisse does it and I have lots of artists do, which is she kind of draws an outline and then colors it in. And I think that this is one of the reasons that I'm also really drawn to printmaking because a lot of printmaking is kind of like, drawing a line and coloring it in, drawing a shape and putting a pattern in it. You know, that's kind of, uh, it makes sense to me that that's stuff that I'm drawn to. I have never had the chance to see Hilma Clint's work in person. I've only ever seen it on the internet. And it is some of that work that I feel like I must be vastly different in person because of the scale. And because I think colors are never truly uh represented when you see it but uh mom what were you were saying you were just thinking of home of clint today what were you well, thinking i was at, and i was thinking of her as someone whose work i haven't responded to i do think mm -hmm. the fact that we only see these through the internet and they're huge and yet on the internet they're very small probably mm -hmm. does them a disservice because you might get immersed in it differently to me frankly they feel decorative and decorative mm. is not necessarily what I'm looking for. I think that's fair. And I think that of all the pieces that are in this slideshow in the like area, they're the most held to me. They're the most like with center composition and things within the borders and not necessarily things floating out. And yet I still find them. There's something about them that appeals to me. Okay. Okay. 
So this is now one that you was on your like list, which is Miro, super famous, incredibly well known, one of the great masters of abstract art. Uh, I picked again because his work is so large, and I think it's unfair because his work is often simplified, and we see it small, and it seems it's just different than when you understand the scale of it. So this is an exhibition photo from an exhibition he had called Miro, The Color of My Dreams at the Grand Palais in 2018. That's in France, in case you were wondering. Um, and mom, why did you pick Miro? First, the colors shimmer. The mm. colors themselves, this blue and this red streak on the left, they're alive. They have some of the feeling that that you get from some other people who work almost only in color, that the colors are calling out to me. They're immersing me in a world of color. And then there's a playful and interesting interplay between the red and the black on each of them. They're like alive little forms that are having a life of their own, a conversation of their own. I feel that something fascinating is being said, and I want to look some more and figure out what the conversation is about. Uh, I just feel that it's interesting. Each of these is a conversation, and I'm invited in to participate in the conversation too, as well as soon as I can find the words, but they evoke, both of these evoke a lot of joy in me. So for me, I appreciate the mastery of being able to get something so simple. Do you know what I mean? Like he hasn't really boiled down, but he's uh, spent his life trying to get art to be like, what is the most simple way of doing this? Why use five lines when you can use one? Why use six dots when you can use one? Like, what is the most simple way of saying that? And I think Miro is a master of simplicity in that way. I think that it's, I like busy. <laughs> that could be an understatement. I like things that are intensely busy. I respond to wallpaper that's insane. I respond to clutter core. I respond to a gallery walls. I respond to pattern on pattern on top of some pattern and then throw in another piece of pattern. So this work for me, I just kind of, I glance over it. I think it's the kind of thing I once went on a tour of um, a Rothko exhibit and the tour guide said, pick a Rothko and stand in front of it and she put on a timer and you had to just like stare at this one if you don't unfamiliar with Rothko Rothko's color field paintings which are basically these like stripes of color um and and you but not like little stripes like just like three stripes of color or two stripes of color on a huge canvas and she was like just look at it and it is true that after some time looking at it you realize that it's more differentiated than how i just described it there are places where like there's a gradation or things touch or there's texture that you didn't realize and so it's interesting to look at it a little longer i think it made me appreciate rothko more i don't think it made me necessarily respond to rothko more and i suspect that miro is the same way so i'm not sure that i fully describe these paintings Things, but it's both of them are two large horizontal blue uh uh dominantly blue pieces uh one of them has a large red it's not really a stripe it's more like a mark uh that's at a slight angle very sort of hand drawn and then a series of dots misshapen dots of different sizes almost like a sentence in a row like or a trail of ants or something uh and the second piece has um a red dot and a black dot and a line. And that is a terrible way of describing them. So you should definitely take a peek at some Miro work if you haven't seen it. But they're very, very simplified compositions. And I just have trouble jumping into those. I it's wonder if you saw them in person, if you would feel differently because for example the blue it's not just flatly applied like with a roller you know what I mean the way you yeah. do a wall I think there's a lot of gradations and changes and subtle subtle texture I think if we were seeing it in person we'd be able to appreciate that and just the it, the, it is 
these ones vibrate to me. Yeah. So again, I feel they're making sound and they sort of, you know, you can sit and look at the sky, a clear blue intense sky. And it's not just that it's flat and blue. There's something there that draws you in the same way. Or I could feel I'm looking under the sea. Uh, I just, I respond to these strongly. I think this is kind of like if I look at my house and there is no clutter, it doesn't make me feel calm and relaxed. It makes me feel like tense, like, and I have to be so careful and I don't like it. Like I like clutter and these are very uncluttered. But I also think one thing you said is like in person, it would be different. And I think we talked about that too with the helmet of Klimt things, just because they're so big which is, so for instance, I, so I belong to a crit group. And one of the things that we talked about is that it's really different seeing the work in person when we give critique to each other than it is um, seeing it online. And we agreed as a group that we were gonna try to uh, only see crit critique work in person because we meet one month in person and one month on Zoom. And that when we met on Zoom, we would talk about like career issues or other like technical issues. But when we met in person, we would talk about the art because you really, it's so hard, right? To talk about it when you don't see it in person. It's just very different. Okay, let's keep moving. So Frank Stella is definitely an artist that you need to see in person. He's on my like list. I picked two, speak, speaking of chaos, uh, I picked two pieces of his. So Frank Stella has a lot of different styles that he works in, but uh, two dominant ones I picked are sculpture, which are these sort of abstract sculptures. They definitely hang on the wall. They're not floor sculptures and they're dimensional, but they usually only come out like a foot or two. They don't come out like enormously, you know, 10 feet into the room or anything. And they're always, it's as if you could take an abstract painting and instead of painting the line on it, you built it out of a material and it, it stood out a foot from the canvas. And then you were able to take a shape. And again, instead of painting it, it was dimensional and it went on. And then the other piece I picked is called the Dual E. It's from 2001. So, I mean, relatively recent, I suppose. Um, and, oh my God, I'm so old if I think 2001 is relatively recent, aren't I? I'm so old. Okay. Anyway, I'm you guys, I just realized on this podcast that I'm so old. And I'm glad we could all share this together. Uh, anyway, so he also does abstract paintings that have very much the same feeling of his sculpture. He has a lot, I mean, just a cacophony of shapes and colors and lines and textures using different materials. Fun fact, he uses acrylic. I know so many people think that you have to use oil to be a fine artist, but Frank Stella is an acrylic artist. Um, he's also a Massachusetts uh, he was born in Massachusetts. It's just for fun because I'm from Massachusetts. So I like to brag about that, but he does live in New York City. Um, and I, I love what he does. I think it's absolutely just makes me want to look closer. It feels alive. I love the managed chaos of it, the thoughtful chaos of it. The question that I always ask myself when I approach a Frank Stella piece is could I take anything away or would I add anything? And I think so often he manages to really hit for me that idea of like, you look at it and you go, ah, and then you look closer and you go, hmm, and you start to really um, get into the piece in ways that I find really fun. So for me, he's dynamic, he's interesting. I love the work that he does. When I grow up, I wanna be Frank Stella. Uh, Mom, do you respond to Frank Stella's work? Not like you do. In fact, I do respond to it in a completely different way, which is I immediately feel hostile. <laughs> I feel that these are aggressive works of art that are trying to dominate me somehow. Mm. The music that I hear when I look at them is very clashing and discordant and dissonant and is surrounding me in a way that I don't feel 
pleasant. Mm. Wouldn't want them in my home because I think I would always be feeling challenged by them in a way that would make me uncomfortable. It has nothing to do with his skill or with his choices or with his with the things I see there. It's simply for some reason the emotional reaction I have is make it stop. <laughs> There is a certain discordant quality. Like you can imagine, you know what I mean? That his, you know, his art is like somebody blaring a trumpet in your face. Like it is loud and it is aggressive. And I think I was in my face. I mean, even though it's a beautifully crafted potlet, I just feel like it's forcing me it's agitating me mm-hmm. in a way that I don't want to be agitated. Yeah. And for, so for me, I love that it's doing something like it's activating me and I find that really exciting. And so it's so interesting in my own work uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to be loud and aggressive. And so often people say to me, this is overwhelming. This is really aggressive. And I'm like, great. And they're like, no, it's aggressive. And I'm like, great. And we have this weird conversation where they're responding in the way that I want them to, but they don't like it. And they're confused as to why I'm saying great. And it's, uh, you know, it's like writing a play and it has, scenes and maybe an ending that people don't like because it makes them feel something that they don't want to feel it doesn't mean it's a terrible play uh but it it does mean that certain people will not respond to it oh yeah yeah frank can tell you music yeah and you know this about me i went to see the movie sophie's choice long ago when it first came out i had not read it and i hadn't realized what her choice would have to be and the moment it was happening on the screen, I froze. I was paralyzed. I gripped the arm of the person I was with, and then I couldn't speak from that point on during the film. And when I came out, I was, I couldn't stop shaking. It was just, it destroyed me. And I could never see that. And even though I know what's going to happen now, if I see it again, I can't watch that again. It does again, it doesn't mean it's a bad book and a bad movie and wonderful performances, but it just I did not want to be ripped apart like that. Yeah. I but think possibly that was the intention, you know. And I think it's so interesting because I think that there is I talk about this a little bit with some of the artists in my crick group. We talk a little bit about like saleable work versus like noteworthy art versus you know what's museum work and that they are sometimes different like at the end of the day people mostly want sofa paintings which which is to say a painting you can hang over your sofa that maybe is like interesting but pretty much non-offensive if you look at any staged house if you look at interior design stuff like most of the time it's pretty non-aggressive it often has a lot of neutral colors it often is like do you know what i mean some simple inoffensive like shapes lines all that kind of stuff and that's very very saleable it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad or good it's just very saleable then if you look at museums there's stuff that's much more aggressive stuff that's often ugly stuff that's like difficult stuff that maybe you're like why is this pile of junk here but it's uh it's saying something it's about something it's from an artist who you know has an interesting history or provenance and to me in some ways this is a little bit like the difference between like fashion and couture which is to say most of us like fashion that is wearable (laughs) you know you can walk down the street and nobody's like what is she wearing but there are some people who are buying the crazy couture outfits that come down the runway even though they're like a step beyond what people sort of have in their homes and i think a lot of what frank stella does i will just say i don't think that i don't think it's right to call art that doesn't upset you as saleable i think what i would say is i'm not looking to have constant emotional negative feelings so i may like to look at some of this art but i wouldn't like to live with it that's all i'm saying well we can agree to disagree then 
Uh, okay, so next up is Helen Frankenthaler, who you picked. I picked actually two fairly recent pieces of hers. Again, this is how old I am to call them fairly recent, but she was making art in the 60s. Um, so one, the first one is Untitled. Uh, it has some numbers after it, which I think is part of how they figure out because she has so many untitled works um, from 1991. And then a piece from the Helen Frankenthaler retrospective exhibit that was at Gagosian in recently in 2021, which I think I can call recently since it was only like three years ago. Um, so Helen Frankenthaler's work that we have here, since you can't see it if you're listening to the podcast, is uh, sort of blobs is the best way that I can think to describe it. She's very famous for painting on unprimed canvas and allowing her oil paint to stain the canvas in this way that creates kind of a halo around the work as the oil kind of wicks away from the pigment into the canvas. Um, and that uh, kind of work of like shapes and overlapping colors and how it affects the surface, I think is something that you see throughout her career. So the two pieces, the untitled piece is a horizontal rectangle dominated by a large blue shape that is made up of many different blues and some browns. Then there's kind of a secondary line that looks to me like it's drawn in a kind of green color that has some coral at the bottom. Then there's a large piece. There's a person for scale where she's, I would say, half the size of this vertical canvas. It is intensely orange red with a, a sort of a dark brown. And it's almost like layers of blobs that sort of create a curvy central figure, so to speak, abstract figure. And then there is a surround of kind of a burnt orange color around it does that seem like an accurate description of what you're seeing mom yeah it's hard to describe because it's th there are no regular fully defined shapes that are made by straight lines i will say that the one on the right which is the red one if you look at it for a while there's motion which is exciting that this thing, which at first looks like it might just be static areas of color, offers motion. And it, there's a feeling of uh, excitement. Red, I think, part, is partly that. But then the excitement is not a bad thing. Uh, because it's not to me, to me, agitation. It's just heightened awareness. Uh, I would I describe see. the orange one as like for my, I respond to it better than a Rothko color field, but it has some things in common with a Rothko color field. Rothko color field, a little more square, a little more regular. This is almost like uh, hearkening back to demon corn a little bit with the layers that are kind of uneven you know, where things kind of aren't quite exactly strata, but ish in there. It has that sort of hand feel. Um, and I definitely have that, but it's, but it holds together like as a step. Well, I will tell you that what's, I, if you look at it for a while, this is of course on the computer, it's a huge painting, but on the computer, it's a small little print. It has, the quality of the different areas of color recede and then come toward you so that at various times, depending on the way you're looking at it, one thing may seem to be on top and then the suddenly another thing is on top, on the top layer. I mean, and I, I just, I feel, I feel something when I look at it. As for the blue one, untitled, it's amazing what a difference that green so wavy line makes. If you look at it without the wavy line, without that little bit of coral at the bottom, it's a totally different effect. I, I just think it's really smart, and I definitely feel motion again. 
It's almost as if it's rushing to the right, some kind of a microscopic animal. Some kind. It's just. I want it to be birds on the ocean. Okay, I just feel like I'm looking maybe through a microscope at some particular tiny microscopic animals of some kind. I I feel that there's heft and weight which contrast with the idea that in my mind, whatever it is, is very small in reality. So that's mm -hmm. a contrast with the one on the right, the red one, which is actually very big. And yet she's give, made an equal weight mm -hmm. to the thing that's in actuality very small and the thing that's in actuality very big. I, I really feel that I am, I, I could, again, I could look at these over and over again from, and see different things each time, feel different things each time. And I could enjoy the music that they're making for me in my head. I think Helen Frankenthaler is another artist who is trying to say the most with the least. You know, yeah. there's, there's a spareness in her work where she's putting in sort of like what's necessary and trying to strip away anything that's unnecessary. And you know what I appreciate about that? I appreciate the intellect mm -hmm. that is at work here. I appreciate the uh, elegance mm -hmm. that is happening in front of me. So this is an artist I picked, uh, Woo Kyung Choi. She's a Korean abstract expressionist. I think uh, she died in the 80s. Um, these are two pieces from the 1960s. I love her work. I think she's one of like the unsung women of abstract expressionism, partially because she's Korean. So I think that was really, and partially because she's a woman, she just doesn't, hasn't had a lot of press, particularly in America, I feel like. Both of them are entitled untitled one is just sort of given a 1960s provenance and the other one is from 1966 so to describe them let's see one is horizontal one is vertical they both have heavy use of a kind of rich indian yellow um they are definitely bold colors somewhat irregular shapes with some recognizable things the horizontal one features stripes one of my favorite features ever and curves um, they, she tends to have large scale shapes with some smaller kind of paintbrush line work. They're very active. They're very full of motion. They give you the sense of, um, having been put together quickly, even though I'm sure that that is not true at all, but they have that kind of energetic, um, brush stroke, that kind of gestural too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They feel spontaneous, even if they may yes. not be. They do. And I think her colors are just so lovely. And I like there's a green in the uh, horizontal one that is I just want to dive into. And I would have been afraid there's a red square in that one. And I would have been a little bit afraid to go Christmas with that red and that green. But it doesn't read that way at all. And I think she's just her work to me is like exciting and dramatic and interesting and I want to look at it and compelling and I want to analyze it and it makes me feel excited and yet it doesn't do the thing that Frank Stella does. It's definitely not heavy metal music, but it is loud. It is like you would, this is a painting you would put it in your living room and everybody would walk in and would look at that painting first. Okay, I'm going to tell you this. I have never seen her work before, and I love it. And that may surprise you. It's not, it's not pretty. Mm -hmm. It's full of sort of half-seen shapes that could be something or nothing. I mean, like the horizontal one on the left. I keep looking at that thing that looks like a veiled ninja peeking out from behind the green <laughs> or on the, on the one on the right the the vertical i keep looking at is it a bedroom is it a bed and is that this is going to sound crazy a monkey in a pink jacket on the bed i mean it's playful and mm -hmm. i love that it's playful 
And I love that I, again, could look deeply a lot of times and see something different. And then if I showed this to someone else, they would have a completely other feeling. But this is the kind of the kind of music that when you hear it, you've got it. Everybody's, well, let's have a dance party. It just feels mm -hmm. like a dance party happening. Yeah, and I think like some of the, her gestural brushwork, I definitely feel is in that Corn Berkeley, you know, the first pieces we looked at school where it's like, it's a color field, but there's something about it where you see the artists really scrubbing in there, that hand, the way that the dirty brush transferred some color, like there's something about it that just really, really speaks to me. And she uses a lot of white. I know that seems like a silly thing, but there aren't a ton of artists who do go all the way to white. In some cases, I think it's the white of the canvas, and in some cases, it's definitely applied white paint. And I just find that really appealing because it makes her painting seem so bright. You don't list the sizes. Are they big, these? Yeah, from my understanding of it, I mean, she is one of those artists, like, I've never seen her work in person. I think that most of her work is still in Korea. Um, and as far as I know, she hasn't had like a huge retrospective in America, but I suppose I could do a little more research to find out if I'm a liar or not. Um, but I, I get the sense they're it's all in centimeters. <laughs> so I think though, they seem, they seem like they're big. I think there's just so much fun in these and I would like to have dinner with her because I bet she'd be fun and quirky. You know mm -hmm. what it makes me think of too? some of the clothing designers whose work I really love are Korean and they do wild and wacky things that you wouldn't expect with the clothes because they're not restricted by the idea of what, what a blouse should look like, you know, what a body shape should be. And I, there's a, there's a feeling of, uh, excitement but in a good way to me it's not threatening it's inviting me to participate and i mm -hmm. like that well i'm so glad i could introduce you to an artist i feel i feel very very smart right now so you'll have to come back next week for part two of this podcast. In the meantime, if you want to connect, you can find me at juliebalzer.com or all over social media as at Balzer Designs. Uh, I hope you'll sign up for the free weekly newsletter. That's the best way to make sure you keep up on the latest news. There's a big button on the homepage of juliebalzer.com where you can do that, or you can go to the show page for this podcast to find the link. Uh, if you'd like to help the show, you can leave a review, mention us on social media or tell a friend. All of those things help other people find the show. So thank you so much for listening and subscribing. We'll see you the next time on the Adventures in Arting podcast.